Hello and welcome to the Organic Gardening Podcast. My name is Sarah Brown and I'm joined by my friend and colleague Chris Collins. We both work at Garden Organic and we're here to bring you tips and advice each month on how to grow the organic way. This month it's all about getting ready. The weather can be dodgy for plants in March, so we thought we'd share ideas with you on how to get your growing area into good shape before the growing season takes off. You won't be surprised to hear it involves compost. Our special guest this month will bring joy to your ears. Adrian Thomas from the RSPB shares with me the secrets of birdsong, that all-important soundtrack to our life outdoors. And I love the fact that some birds have excitement calls. They get so excited about something that they can't stop themselves making sounds. (laughs) And our post bag brings a really interesting trio of questions. What to plant in an allotment which needs to stay fallow this year? How to cope with a sea of mud? And are the new peat-free bagged potting mixes okay? But a word from our wonderful sponsor, the Organic Gardening Catalogue, before we start. You can check out their catalogue online at organiccatalogue.com. You'll find a complete range of organic gardening products from seeds and plants to equipment. Have a look at their latest offer on wooden compost bins. It's at organiccatalogue.com forward slash P-O-D-2. And don't forget, if you're a member of Garden Organic, you'll get 10% off. So, whether you're in the garden, out running or curled up with a cuppa, I hope you truly enjoy this latest episode. I'm off now to join Chris in his potting shed. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? I'm very well, Sarah. How are you? Actually, I'm fine. And I have this feeling about March that it's a kind of start-stop month. Do you know what I mean? The first time the sun has real warmth, but then there's this terrible risk of flood and frost. <laughs> there is still technically, in many ways, winter, isn't it, March? At least till the end of it. And I, I kind of think that it's a difficult time for gardeners because we are chomping chomping at the bit to get going i mean i've got packets of seeds lying around everywhere and i would love to get going on them but we need to keep the rains on for the moment don't we sarah i think so even though we do enjoy the first day of spring in march but if you remember what was it three four years ago we had the beast from the east do you Mm. remember that and we were covered in snow yeah it, it we're chomping at the bit but just hold back a bit maybe so what will we be doing do you reckon this month what are the important jobs chris well certainly preparing the soil on my beds where i've i've dug in a few um green manures my, my mustard always dig that in nice and early otherwise it gets a bit coarse so i've kind of forked that in i've forked the ground and i'm adding compost as well and i'm making my seed beds ready really i do have a little trick um, um of putting down a bit of fleece on an area because i want to grow salad crops and i think that helps warm the soil up a bit so I can get sowing earlier because you're obviously getting in a race with the weeds, especially on my allotment. So that kind of helps. But it's all about preparation. It's all about getting ready, making sure that soil's nice and tilth. It's got new organic matter on it to help the structure and provide new nutrients. And the only other thing I'm really up to is I'm sowing stuff indoors. You can start sowing indoors, things like chilies aubergines tomatoes and they're all filling my propagators as we speak so there is some fun to be had sarah i'm glad you mentioned the word compost chris what would an organic gardening podcast be without the word compost in it (laughs) exactly i think it's quite good to remind ourselves actually what homemade compost does it adds nutrients to the soil we know that and rather than putting in an artificial fertilizer compost will have this slow release mechanism of nutrients over over the whole growing season because the soil life will be absorbing it redigesting it and giving out those nutrients to the plant roots and by soil life i mean the worms and the other bugs and microbes in the soil so one it adds nutrients the other thing that it does is it improves the soil texture so if you've got a very light sandy soil homemade compost will bulk it up so the soil will hold moisture if you've got a heavy clay type soil then the compost will help break that down again to allow the plant roots to access the moisture and the nutrients successfully so it can also help prevent flooding that's quite important at this time of year and then finally that lovely homemade compost you're going to be adding it all through the growing season because it also creates a mulch around each plant which protects the soil from drying out when we get those dry summer months so yeah compost it's wonderful in what it can do and it's very easy to make and it's free 
Sorry, that was a long answer, wasn't it, Chris? No, that's fine. I loved it. Totally involved in it there. <laughs> so go to the Garden Organic website and find out how to make your own compost and have fun. And I sort of feel that's very much a March thing to do, isn't it? To turn your compost heap if you've already got one, but also why not set up a new one? I think it's it really is just, I know we say this over and over, we can't stress it enough. It is the miracle of nature. It's the miracle of gardening. And uh, we'd all be lost without it. I think um, we need to appreciate composting a lot more than we do. Yeah. Okay, so I've got a little tiny orchard here in the corner of my garden. And I'm out there this month because I'm lightly forking the soil over around the little fruit bushes. I've got quite a lot of black currant bushes in there. I've got apple trees, small cherry tree. The reason I'm lightly forking the soil over is that I'm beginning to expose the soil as it begins to warm up. And then the birds can come in and they will enjoy eating the bugs, particularly those pest chrysalises, those little bugs and microbes that are there waiting in the soil. And then once the birds have had time to get the nourishment from eating those, those bugs, then I'll put a fresh mulch of compost, you guessed, back around the fruit trees themselves. Perfect, Sarah. I, I, the only other thing I'm going to be doing, I think, and um, because we've had this weather down south, is um, just doing a little bit of repair work. I, all my sort of upright posts that I grow, beans and uh, my, even my soft fruit against, have all took a bit of a battering. So, Chris, do you think I should also be looking at my little bit of lawn? Yes, it's a good time to be looking at it. I think um, over the winter, we probably had some wet weather, etc. You might find that a little bit of moss might have got in, especially if you want a heavy soil. But this is a time of year I like to scarify. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Scarify means to, to run a, like a lawn uh, rake over it. And what that does is it removes the thatch. And the thatch is the buildup of sort of dead materials, dead leaves, if you like, which gathers underneath the crowns of the plants. And if you do it this time of year, you take that out, basically it will break all the sort of stolons, the, the, the underground stems that the grass grows out of in crowns. And it breaks all those and it causes new crowns to grow. So it thickens the, right, the, the whole sward up. The other thing that's quite important as well is I don't want to see a lawn that's just got grass in it. It's very boring. You might as well conquer it and paint it green really so i like to see my my bellies my daisies in there speed well i like to see clover is very very important in nature and as it fixes nitrogen and so what, what happens is when you scarify you also tend to vegetatively propagate those plants they're very easy to vegetatively propagate so you're spreading them throughout the lawn and thickening them up and that means also you're not doing it later when they'll be flowering and biting pollen to our insect life that's a really good tip, Chris. That's worth knowing. I'll be out there with my rake, scarifying. <laughs> I think from everything we've said, it kind of reminds me of when I was a child. We were always doing running races and we always start off the race by saying, ready, get set, go. And there's something about March that's the ready and the get set. We haven't quite got to go. That'll be April onwards. But would you agree? <laughs> it's very tempting because the sun came out just for 20 minutes and I could feel it on the back of my neck and you start to get excited. You're like, it's it. We're coming out of the dark months. Of, but just, just take a breath. Be a little. We're good at being patient, us gardeners. So let's just apply that. Cold winds in March, you can get radiation frost, even on a, you know, a sunny day where it kind of feels warm. The sun goes down, the heat rises and you get cold air and that can damage your plants as well. But particularly cold winds, if you go too early that cold wind will damage the leaves of any tender plant and they don't really get going again they're slower out of the traps when the season gets underway proper so just hang on a bit take your time there's plenty of time ahead i'm sure we'll all have a great growing season you're absolutely right chris i think beyond frost alert is the best thing to say this month and next month okay so what would be your plant of the month chris well, I'm going to go for a nice old native. Everybody knows it. I suppose in a way it's associated with winter in many respects, but Ilex aquifolium. I love a holly bush. The um, reason I'm main, naming this plant is I have a fence at the bottom near, near the allotments that people tend to cut through or sometimes people come in, there's a little bit of damage done. So we were look, thinking about what can we do to protect that area and Ilex aquifolium and the holly has got those lovely spiny leaves in it. It'll, uh, no one wants to walk through one. It really is a very good barrier, but also it's native. So if you put a male and a female together plants, because they're dioecious you'll get tons of those bright red berries they'll form in the autumn they'll last all through the winter and they'll be a nice source of food for our little birds so protection native helps the wildlife stop people invading the allotment it's a good one all round. sounds perfect and as you say it's a lovely native and it, it looks good i love those glossy dark leaves okay well hold your horses won't you don't get rushing out there but take care yeah you too sarah lovely to chat to you as always and you bye bye-bye 
Now, I want you to stop whatever you're doing and listen. Isn't that the most gorgeous sound? And I realised the other day that birdsong is the soundtrack to my gardening. But, being ever curious, I wanted to know more about the birds that share my garden. Not necessarily to identify them, we have books and binoculars for that, but I wanted to know more about why the birds were singing and how they make that glorious noise. So I had the privilege of speaking to Adrian Thomas from the RSPB, and he spent a lifetime studying and recording bird song. But before we start, I just want to thank Adrian for sharing some of his recordings, including the one we've just heard. I'll give you details at the end of our chat of Adrian's book and sound files so that you too can get immersed in this fascinating subject. Adrian, hi, how are you? Sarah, I'm I'd like to say I'm really, really well. I have a slightly sore throat. Let's hope, hope it holds out. Ah, it's very kind of you to join us despite all that. I'm sure it'll be fine. Adrian, when I walk down my garden, at the moment, I'm surrounded by birdsong, particularly robins. There must be half a dozen of them bobbing alongside of me. <laughs> I like to think they're singing for joy. And like me, they're celebrating the end of winter and perhaps the joys of spring to come. But I have a feeling you're going to tell me something different. And I'm going to tell you, as simply as I can, quite a complicated story here. So let's leap straight in. Most birds sing in order to either attract a mate or to defend a territory or both. And robins are doing both. And now, now that spring is beginning to really begin to ease in, then they're feeling the urge and the hormones arising that say that the males have got to start singing to attract a mate. But interestingly, with robins, females sing as well. So they're one of the few British birds where the female sings almost as much as the male because she needs to hold a territory as much as he does. So there's the start of the answer. But only in the last year, we found out that there seems to be good evidence that songbirds, when they sing, are getting a kick out of it at the same time. They actually enjoy the process of singing and they're releasing pheromones while they're doing it just for the fun of it. Oh, that's so what I wanted to hear. I mean, I accept they're not singing for my purposes, <laughs> but it gives me such joy. I really like the idea that it's giving them joy because actually that was one of my questions. Why do birds sing? I did want to ask, is it ever for pure joy? And that's a, a lovely thing, isn't it? I think that the, the kind of follow on question is, OK, it might be song might be to defend a territory and to attract a mate. But how does song do that? How is it that just making a noise might deliver those end products from it? And there's a lot of work being done on this. And it's, it's all to do with the ability of other birds, usually of the same species, to recognise within the vocabulary, within the song repertoire, how strong, how fit that bird is. Really subtle signals coming across that effectively say, listen to the size of my repertoire. You don't want to mess with me because I've got all the songs I could possibly need and I've got all the time to sing because I don't need to go feeding, I'm so fit. Similarly, female birds are listening and going, is this a suitable father to raise my young? And if the male has got a large repertoire and appears to be singing loudly and boldly and confidently, that is the signal that she's, she's looking for. It's almost like the song is their plumage, isn't it? Because we know that that also has an effect on... Uh, that, that's right, indeed. Although you'll probably recognise that there are plenty of garden birds where the male isn't more brightly coloured than the female. You'd struggle to tell a male from a female robin, same with Dunnock. And in those cases, song has to be the primary attractant, the primary determinant for the female. And when you think about it, it it's a, a brilliant innovation for evolution that the thing that displays, the thing that shows your virility and your capacity to be a father of the mate is sound, which for many birds is what they need because they live in such dense cover up in the trees. They're there when the leaves break. They can display all of their qualities often while remaining hidden which is a wonderful evolutionary adaptation to do it in that closed environment and also keep yourself safe from predators while you're displaying your wares. Do you know I'd never thought of it that way Adrian. Okay can we get a little bit technical here? How do birds sing? 
I mean, mm. it is such a loud noise from such a tiny body. Two things I'm going to quickly cover here. One is the physiological element, which is where does this sound emanate from? The talking that we're doing now is incredibly minute manipulation of the larynx at the back of our throat. In birds, it's very, very similar, but it's further down the windpipe where it divides to go to the lungs. And it, instead of being called the larynx, it's a, an organ called the syrinx. And actually, they're making their sounds through two larynx-like organs and can control those independently from each other. So wow. a bird can make two independent sounds at the same time, and they do. And that just adds to the richness of their repertoire. So there we have the, the syrinx, named after the Greek word for panpipe. But there's also, they need the brain capacity to be able to make all of those sounds that they do. And the area of a bird's brain that's used for controlling sound is really quite enlarged compared to many other creatures in, in proportion to the size of their body. And it's also quite analogous to the part of our brain that we use for speech, which I think is beautiful. When you think about birdsong and think, is it music? Is it a language? It's a bit of both. Ah, absolutely. And I've heard bird song slow down and it sounds quite different, doesn't it? It does. And, and I've enjoyed doing that, having been out and recorded so many of Britain's birds, because the theory is that birds can actually what you might call resolve sound much more quickly than we can. They, they hear the sound as if slowed down, or at least that is the theory. It's yet to be proven. But it, if that is the case, then one can better understand how birds are spotting the intricacies within sound and being able to tell whether one bird is singing a better song than another. The wren is a really good example for me. To the human ear, it's quite high pitched. It's incredibly fast and it's rather shrill. Slow it down and it has got such musicality to it. It is astonishing. So there is a bird that within three or four seconds can produce a hundred notes that just run together to the human ear. To female wrens, I do like to think that they're hearing some of the most complex and intricate music that they can and incredibly sweet and musical when they do it. That's amazing. And I'm with you on that one. I think what is the point in producing all that beautiful, beautiful, mellifluous melody and detailed singing? I mean, it has to be there so that the potential mate can hear it. Mm. Do birds learn how to sing or is it inherited? I mean, did that wren know how to sing from the moment it was born or has it listened to its parents singing and then adopted it? I do think that the answer to this is quite amazing. So these songbirds that we're talking about and these smaller birds, they're often called perching birds and they're the wrens, the blackbirds, the thrushes, the finches. They all have to learn their song. If you were to take an egg from a blackbird nest and rear it out of sound, if that is a term, from other blackbirds, it would not be able to sing blackbird song. Oh, it's wow. thought that they start to learn those songs in the egg. That's where the process begins to work. But they then have to practice and modify and develop those songs. And there's a stage in birds development when they're young, where they often sing what's called sub song, much quieter. And it's a practice version. And at that stage, the song is called plastic. I often hear my robins singing their, their sub song. The theory used to be that then you get to a stage where the verses that they've learned crystallize in their head and they don't learn beyond that point. But we're now beginning to see evidence that almost all birds continue to add to their repertoires as they go along, which I think is, is lovely to think that the older a bird gets, the more tunes it's learning. Oh, yes. And also the fact that otherwise they would just repeat their parents' song and actually they're developing and they're developing their own character. It's very easy to be anthropomorphic about this, but it is very similar to human beings, isn't it? It. I mean, a baby can't speak, but it picks up intonation and language and vocabulary from its parents. So I'm also quite interested, why is there such a chorus at dawn? And the simple answer to that is that the birds have to, during the breeding season, when they've got their mate and they're defending a, a nest site, that's quite a tough job to do. And most of our birds, particularly in a garden setting, do what we do and they go to sleep at night. During that period, there is the chance that some birds without a territory have gone a little wander first thing in the morning or last thing at night and have arrived in their territory. So 
at the point where you wake up, you have to proclaim, this is my territory and I'm, I'm still here. I made it through the night, fit and able to defend it. And they all set out to proclaim that. And you can only, uh, only begin to imagine how many birds are wandering out, particularly migrant birds. So birds coming into the UK from Africa where they've spent the winter, they come in in the spring, they're trying to find a territory. It's very likely that a migrant will have arrived during the night, found itself on what looks like a great territory. Well, you've got to be up first thing to say, hold on a minute, just be aware, I'm already here, I'm already in place. It then means that after that point, many birds then have to do a bit of feeding to like build up their reserves again. And they'll often put in a bit of song at different points during the day. And they'll often finish with a bit of a dust chorus, not quite as loud and vibrant as the dawn chorus. But it is that before going to bed, just a, another little warning. I'm still here. I'm off to bed, but I'll, I'll be here in the morning too. So it means that you get these flows of, of volume during the day. And that's a very typical pattern for most of our birds. There are a few variations from that, the nightingale being the most famous. And the reason why the nightingale sings at night is to try and lure down passing females migrating in the skies above. So that brings me on to the next question. There is a difference, isn't there, between a bird singing and a bird calling? Now, I have a blackbird who sits on my apple tree. And just as you said, he, he seems to sing his way as the day ends. He also gives an alarm call, that chinking sort of noise that I think will be very familiar to a lot of people. We'll just play it now. Would you like to explain a bit more about that? Yes, absolutely. That's the call of blackbirds going into roost and other blackbirds from the neighbourhood thinking that they might like to go into that roost too. Often there aren't many great places where you can spend the night, have a safe sleep without being at risk. So these preferred places to roost see different blackbirds arrive in them and those alarm calls are like uh, they are a little bit territorial they're they're unusual and no other bird in our gardens produces such a, a racket at times at night and it is all about choosing the best roost site and advertising that you're there so we saw how song was to do with attracting a mate defending a territory and they have to be learned they're not inherent within the bird calls are inherent with the bird. They are genetically determined. You could take an, an egg out of a nest and it would have its full repertoire of calls already built into it. And it doesn't matter whether it's a male or a female or a young bird, they've got that repertoire of calls. They're there for a variety of reasons. Alarm calls are probably ones that we most recognise because they've got an insistency. We hear the alarm within those calls. It seems to resonate in the, for us in the same way that it does for, for birds. And what you're describing for the blackbird is, in, in many ways, an alarm call. But there must be other reasons that they have an alarm call. Maybe it's danger. Maybe a cat is being predatory. Who are they calling out to? Uh, it's it's a, a brilliant question because you'd think the best thing to do if there was danger is not to make a sound. It's just to get out the way. But by making a sound, it seems that this has been evolutionary, the best response to a predator. Firstly, it tells the predator, I've seen you, and the predator will actually understand that alarm call in the way that we hear alarm calls and, and hear the urgency within it. The predator will go, actually, my chances of catching this are now pretty slim because he, he she is telling me I have been seen. When a sparrowhawk comes towards my garden, I normally hear this ripple of blue tit and great tit alarm calls come before the sparrowhawk actually arrives. So it's a brilliant communication network. Again, this fantastic thing that sound doesn't matter whether the leaves on the trees, whether you're hidden away in vegetation, the sound moves so quickly, faster than any predator can run or fly. Jungle drums effectively runs through everywhere. What's even more fascinating is that there is a particular pitch that if birds use it, it's very difficult for predators to latch onto the location. There is almost um, a ventriloquial quality. And what you find is that the alarm calls of many different birds almost sound identical because they're all using this sound that is very difficult to locate. And it's one of those occasions, uh, a songbird when it's singing, other birds of other species will ignore. So, for example, a robin singing, a wren will ignore it. 
but a wren making an alarm call and effectively share that alarm call along with a whole host of other species. So you get this interspecies communication during periods of alarm. So cats, watch out. Birds are on to you. Yes. And unfortunately, of course, cats get the benefit that many young birds haven't quite tuned into that. They may have the alarm call innate within them, but may not understand the full drama and meaning of that sound, which is why cats are so successful at catching young birds in in the spring and summer. As well as alarm calls, contact calls are a really important part of that. It's about maintaining contact with others, usually of your own species. When it comes to a flock of long-tailed tits, as they rove through gardens, you get this constant little chorus, faint, rather simple, of little syrup and tip type calls. There is the beautiful garden example. And it's all about because they need to know that they're keeping in a a flock means there are more eyes to spot for predators. It means when they get to dusk, they can all roost together and share their bodily warmth. Keeping together is really important. So contact calls are another really common sound that we hear from birds. But then there are fascinating ones. There are begging calls from youngsters. There are calls that are made during mating. Uh, it's, It's a whole repertoire And I love the fact that some birds have excitement calls. They get so excited about something that they can't stop themselves making sounds. (laughs) Adrian, how did you learn all this? It's it's a bewildering world. How did you start? How did you learn all these different things? There's been a bit of research lately, excuse me, jumping topic, but a bit of research that seems to suggest that an inclination to want to be in nature is genetic in humans. I think I must have got that because that's what happened to me as a kid. I was at my happiest, paddling in a stream, wandering through woods, gazing at butterflies and bees and climbing trees and all of those kind of things. But added to that, my dad, who was a maths teacher by day, in his spare time, he was the volunteer manager of a nature reserve in Worcestershire. But the only point where he really engaged with lots of other people was in spring when he'd host guided walks to listen to the nightingales. Ah. They're not there anymore. And people used to come from miles around and listen with a kind of rapt awe as the daylight dribbled away. As the other birds stopped singing, the nightingales would kind of tune up. And then as it went really dark, the nightingales would kick in. I defy anybody for that not to seep into their soul. But I find it very difficult to memorise bird song. So I've, I've, I've got the basics. I know my robin from my blackbird and my pigeon from my crow. But then you get to more subtle things like the difference between a great tit and a chiff chaff, for instance. How did you embed those sounds into, into your own head, into your own memory? Because they're, they're multifarious, these sounds. They, they are indeed. And the great tit being a primary example of that, a, a bird that has such a wide repertoire, And yet there is consistency in the song that isn't to do with effectively the words that the great it is using, but it's to do with the structural element of it. I think I was lucky that I was immersed in those bird songs from a young age at a point when the human brain is learning sounds very quickly. But I remain convinced that all of us have the ability to learn bird sound. When you think about what a precise instrument our ears are that I could play you probably a sound clip of 500 different people and within five seconds of each you could identify who each and every one of those people were. I think we've got that ability to do so but what also fascinated me and what what kind of prompted me to um, uh, want to record birdsong and try and help people learn birdsong more is that I think that we actually have a very poor English vocabulary for describing sounds. When I ask people to describe sounds, they often say, well, it was a kind of twittering noise. And that's often all that they've got to give me. Whereas what, what often defines one bird sound from another could be the length of the song. A reed warbler can sing for three minutes nonstop. No, not many other warblers can do that. A sedge warbler can, but not many others can can do that. It might be to do with whether the song verse that you hear is immediately repeated and then often repeated, or whether every new verse is actually a new verse, if that makes sense. The blackbird, it sings one verse, the next one that you'll hear will be different. It won't do a repeat of what it's just done. 
whereas the dunnock will do a facsimile of the sound that it's just done. So whereas I think people are listening for, well, how can I describe that blibbly, blobbly, blobbly type thing? It may be a, a completely different attribute that you're listening for. So in the case of the, the, the great tit, it very typically does a seesawing teacher, 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 from a high, high note to a low note, repeated about three times, stop, repeat exactly the same. The chiff chaff, its English name sounds, it's derived from its song and you'd think that it went chiff chaff, chiff chaff. But when you stop and listen, you realise it isn't doing it with the pure seesaw of the grated. It's actually going chiff chaff, chof, chof, chiff chaff, chof, chof, chof. There's, there's a greater ver variation within it and not the metronomic quality that you're getting from the great tit. So with each and every bird sound or call, there's often something to really home in on, and it's not often trying to turn into English language the sound that you're hearing. That's so helpful. Thank you, Adrian. I have this image of you being out and about just listening. Uh, I like to think that in times gone by, we didn't have the background noise that we have now. We didn't have the airplanes and the cars. We were out there in the countryside. Our forebears would have been countryside workers. And this would have been, along with the wind and with water, this would have been the natural soundtrack to our lives. And I think because that would have been the case a millennia, it must have, have delved somewhere deep into our, our psyches. Because even those people who struggle to identify one bird sound from the other, when you play bird sound to them or when you talk about bird sound, they instantly talk about it with joy and they find huge pleasure and some sense of relaxation in it. Is it true that birds sound different in different parts of the country? So if I was living in Scotland, would my thrush sound different to that down in Devon? There's some detail behind there. Yes, birds have dialects which is, is wonderful to know. Uh, for me, perhaps one of the, the strongest example is the alarm call that you're talking about for the blackbird. If you went down to the Mediterranean, it's completely different. The second part of the answer to that, however, is that it is important for individual bird songbirds to sound different from their neighbours in order to attract a mate. So one song thrush here in the next field over, that song thrush uh, and will probably need to sound different to stand out from his song thrush. So there is a complexity in, in here, but there is this tendency for dialects as you move to different parts of the country. So birds, they, they provide the sort of wonderful, wonderful background music to, to my gardening, but I know the numbers are declining, Adrian. What are your thoughts on this? I think that one of the things about bird song is it does have the power to be a little bit of a canary in the coal mine. As you say, we know that birds are declining. It's thought that some 44 million birds have been lost from the British landscape since the 1950s. And with that, we've lost a lot of effectively nature's chorus. But it does mean, for example, we've lost a million pairs of skylark. That's a lot of sound mm. to have been lost from the British landscape. We're currently losing chaffinches and greenfinches from gardens. Collar doves are on the decline. Starlings, one of the most declined British birds with one of the most fascinating song abilities uh, of all of our birds, with the ability to mimic everything from machinery to moorhens to owls. The loss of that is something, I think, to be, to be mourned but also a, a wake-up call and, and something to prompt us into action to try and stop that happening. But I take your point. It is chilling that we're losing so many. At Garden Organic, we've written quite a lot on the website about how to bring birds into your garden. And it doesn't matter whether you live in the town or the country, whether you have an allotment, whether you just have a balcony on a flat. There are certain things you can do to bring birds into your garden and to offer them shelter. And on that basis, they will then sing and they will call and we will then perpetuate the different varieties. I couldn't say that better myself, Sarah. And, <laughs> and I get a huge amount of pleasure from doing things in my garden and then seeing nature respond as a result of that. And whether it be doing something that enhances the insect populations that in turn are going to look after the birds, whether it be putting water into the garden that the birds can bathe in and can drink from, whether it be growing things that they then build their nests in, that they safely roost in, that they use as song perches, the results can really be incredibly instant to the actions that we do. 
And the joy that comes from that, I, I know how deep that runs inside me. I love my garden and I love a wildlife field garden. And both of those go incredibly hand in hand. Brilliant. Well, thank you, Adrian, for opening our ears. Birdsong is all the sweeter for knowing a little bit more about how and why and who is singing. So just to finish up, tell me if you had to choose one bird to take on your desert island with you, (laughs) what would it be? And we'll end this chat with it singing. As you can imagine, I'm regularly asked, what's your favourite bird song? And I can say in all honesty that the last bird that I heard is my favourite. People say to me, Adrian, surely not. If it was a a house sparrow that was the last bird that you heard, well, that's not a bird to take you with with you to the desert island. But there is a joy about house sparrow song. And And they chatter. They do with great enthusiasm in what are called house sparrow chapels. I love the sound of a house sparrow chapel. But if you were to put me on the spot, then, and I'm going to be on this desert island, and this is the sound I'm going to be hearing over and over again, then the British bird that can make a thousand different songs and can jam with each of those sounds as creatively as any musician and can do so with such verve and with with such virtuosity, you know I'm talking about the nightingale and that would have to be the one. Brilliant. Thank you, Adrian. Well, here here he comes. And thank you again. It has been such a delight talking to you. Thank you, Sarah. If you want to know more about Adrian's work, please do buy his book. It's called The RSPB Guide to Birdsong, and it covers all the aspects of bird calls and songs which we've just touched on. And can I ask you to buy it direct from the RSPB, not from an online bookseller? That way the charity will benefit from the sales. In our next episode, I'm going to ask Adrian to help us identify half a dozen or so of the most common garden birds. So be sure to press the subscribe button now, otherwise you'll miss out. From Birdsong to Postbags, I'm joined by the team, Hannah, Anton and Chris. Hello, Hello, everyone. Hello. Hannah, what have you got for us today? Okay, we've got three really interesting questions. The first one is from someone who's just taken an allotment, which was purely weeds. They've cleared some and will plant up that part, but would like to know if there's a green way to cover the rest until they're ready to deal with it. They've been advised to just use plastic or manure, but there's still quite a large area and they would like to plant some wildflowers or something that will be beneficial to the wildlife for this year. Chris, I know you've dealt with a very similar situation. What would you recommend? Well, I uh, I empathise with these people because um, I didn't want to just cover it uh, all over and not have it being productive. So what I thought I'd do, I thought I'd have a go at putting some potatoes in because the thing about potatoes is they once they get come up above the soil, they're quite quick growing and they'll put out quite a thick crown and they'll block the light to the soil underneath, which in turn stops uh, um, heavy weed production. Of course, the, uh, it also depends what kind of weeds you've got. I had a lot of pernicious weeds, quite aggressive weeds. So the way I dealt with those is to just get a pair of flat edging shears and I just cut it down, very sharp pair of edging shears and cut it all down flat so I had a nice blank canvas to, to work with. I got in some nice compost and I spread that onto the area I wanted to use. I mean, the more compost you can get your hands on, the better, I think. It depends how much you've got available. Um, I didn't have a massive amount of it, but I put it down and then I literally planted seed pot- potato tubers into it. I, I planted them really dense. Normally, I would plant a potato for about 30 centimetres apart. These were less than that, maybe 20. And they came up pretty quickly and they did the job. They put out their leaves and um, stopped the light coming through. And I got, <laughs> the only downside was I had more potatoes and I knew what to do with. Um, I had a lot of potatoes, but I kind of preferred that than the land just go without use. Another thing you could do, which is quite traditional, is you can plant some pumpkins in it. Put down a big layer of compost and put some pumpkins in. You can literally watch those grow and they'll again cover that land and uh, and make it usable. Okay, and so is there any reason why you pick tubers or pumpkins as opposed to their suggestion of wildflowers? Well, I think on my allotment, I would love to have done wildflowers, even not just seeds and plugs, really. I just think when I'm dealing with things like horsetail, very aggressive, I had a lot of bindweed a lot of cooch grass, I just don't think they would have competed. I think that um, those weeds would have would have outcompeted 
the plugs and the wildflower seed and I'll end it up back at square one. But I'm not saying that's not possible, but I think you'd need to do quite a lot of prep on it. OK, Anton, what would you think? Well, like Chris said, it does depend on the sort of state of your soil and also the sort of weeds that are there. If you've, if you've managed to put a mulch on there and you've got a slightly finer texture on there that you think you'd be able to sow seeds into, then I might go for a green manure mix. There's particularly, there's one that's called tubigan mix, which has got quite a nice mixture of things in it because it's it's got both buckwheat and mustard in them, which are both really quite aggressive plants. They really help to smother the weeds quite quickly. It's even been said that buckwheat is actually sort of active against cooch grass. So that would be quite a good one to choose. And then this mix has also got a lot of other sort of nice flowers in, like um, it's got phacelia in there, it's got calendula, it's got cornflowers in. And so that will help to sort of bring in the pollinators as well, which will be good for the rest of your plot. And it will look very, very pretty as well and that was the tubigon mix is that right tubigon mix yeah it's it's sold in the organic gardening catalogue as well so yeah it's it's a nice mix okay great brilliant so we'll move on to our second question um someone has contacted us and said they've seen some cheap deals on peat-free potting composts would we recommend them or will they be poor quality? Anton, can you kick us off on this one? Yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, I think because we have used to using peat and we're used to having mixes which are actually very, very cheap, um, peat is a very uniform product and that, that's why it's been so popular with the horticultural industry for a long time. Um, if you get a very cheap peat-free mix, you're not quite sure what you're going to be getting because peat-free mixes are obviously a blend of materials and so there can be a lot more variable. My advice would be to perhaps just buy one bag of it and give it a try and see what it's like. I certainly wouldn't buy sort of 20 bags of it. Take it home, have a look at it, see whether it's a sort of really coarse or whether you think it's a sort of material that's going to be good for growing plants in and sort of holding the water. So have a go and have an experiment with it first. And if they go for this peat-free mix, do they need to treat it any differently if they're perhaps used to a peat-based growing medium? Yes, particularly with the watering. Uh, Peat is very easy to judge the moisture content of it because it appears slightly lighter coloured when it's dry and then it goes darker when it's moist. Whereas the peat free mixes, you don't really get that sort of indication. So you, you do need to feel your pot Put, put your finger in into the mix and see whether, whether it's wet or not, because quite often it might have dried out on the top, but still be wet underneath. So you might be in risk of overwatering. Generally, the peat free mixes, you need to water a little bit more often. So little and often with those types of mixes. Anton, it's interesting that you referred to the peat free mixes being slightly coarser. And I've certainly noticed that uh, there's, you know, really quite big chunks in it, bits of bark it looks like and, and wood product you need to be mindful perhaps to sieve that if you're potting on your seedlings into this growing compost because I think they'll come it, they'll find it difficult to get their roots established in this coarse mix wouldn't you agree Chris yes I would I must admit I am from the uh, don't skimp sort of camp to be honest with you just because especially when I'm sort of pricking out seedlings and moving them on, it's quite a fundamental stage. But I understand that economically that not, might not be for everyone, so the sieving is a really good tip. I have bought a bag of quite cheap peat-free compost, and it is heavy, it is coarse. You do get lots of bark in it. and, and um, So just get a sieve over it and fine it up a bit, and you'll, you'll be away. Great, thank you. So on to our final question. Someone says they've just moved into a house and the developers have left their garden as a sea of mud. What would our first steps be? Chris, where would you start? Move house. No, I'm joking. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, to me, this is quite good because I, like, I love a blank canvas. I think you'll find most kind of gardeners like the idea of having something they, they can work with from scratch. It's quite common to get really heavy soil when you move to a new, a brand new build. I think what tends to happen is the, the topsoil tends to get skimmed off and move somewhere else and you're left with the rubbish and that. And you can also get really heavy clay as well on a lot of new builds. Um, the first of all, you've got to sit down and decide what it is you want. Are you a family? Have you got two kids that are running around? Is there a dog? That kind of thing. Are you going to be out there having barbecues? How are you going to use it is quite important. I would then sort of sit down and just have a little sketch about, about how you want it to look. Always think of your garden as a cube. 
never think of it as flat because you can then plant up there. You'll have probably high fences. You can plant up the sides, bring everything up. I would be tempted if it was mine to go for raised beds because that means you can bring in some decent topsoil. You can make them out of sleepers, bring it in. It might save you a lot of hassle trying to turn the heavy soil you've already got round to make it workable. Um, if you did want to keep it open ground, put in a soak away at the lowest point of the garden, maybe some gravel ch uh, channels, which are a bit, bit like 30 centimetre deep holes that you fill with gravel, that'll help. But I think stick with that. Maybe you want a nice hard, a nice hard standing area, put your uh, chairs on and then do your raised beds. And that could be, you can grow a little bit of veg in those, flowers, it's manageable, easy to work with. Always remember wildlife, maybe cut a hole in the bottom of the fence, what you call the, the kickboard or the gravel board. If you cut a hole in that, you might get hedgehogs coming in. You've got a little bit of movement to and forth of wildlife. You can put, bug hotel in also if you're using raised beds they will leach after a while which means the nutrients will wash through and they gradually deplete the soil depletes so get yourself a compost bin it's always great fun making compost it's a little miracle of its own right so you can top dress your raised beds every year and keep that soil nice and healthy and workable but i think just remember this it's your space you can do what you like with it it's a blank canvas so sit down work out what you're going to use it for and get growing. Anton, are there any essentials that you would suggest going? I think Chris has covered all the essentials pretty well, really. I, I, I think perhaps just be realistic about what time you've got as well. Perhaps start, start off slightly small and, and then you can always scale things up. And just enjoy your garden as well. Just be aware of all the sort of wildlife that's in there. That's I think that's the most important thing. I agree, Anton. I think just because your garden might be small or a sea of mud in and, and, and a new house... There's no reason not to approach it from the organic point of view and bring in as much wildlife as you can and enjoy it. Share that space with the wildlife. I don't know if it's worth mentioning, but if the person who's writing is, a, is new to gardening, but we do have a very nice little booklet called First Steps in Organic Gardening. And it, it's a neat little booklet and it'll give you ideas right from the word go on how to approach your space from the organic point of view. That's fantastic. Well, thank you all, and we'll catch you next month. Cheers, Anna. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone. And thank you for listening. Don't forget, if you want to learn anything more about the topics we've discussed, there's loads of advice on the Garden Organic website. That's gardenorganic.org.uk. It's Mothering Sunday this month, so why not give your mum the present of membership? She'll get the Garden Organic Members magazine, a dedicated email advice line for all her growing queries, and of course 10% off any purchase from the Organic Gardening Catalogue. Just go to our website, www.gardenorganic.org.uk, for further details. And be sure to subscribe to this podcast. That way you won't miss a thing. Our next episode is a little extra one. It's a second take on the joys of birdsong, when Adrian helps you to identify some of the common garden birds you might be hearing. Yes, you will be able to tell your great tit from your chiff-chaff. And feel free to review us or share your thoughts on social media. We're at Garden Organic UK. We love hearing from you. Bye for now, and thanks to Kevin McLeod for providing the music.